All right, are y'all ready? Let's see what I know throughout the years because that's what you're getting today. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your word. And though, Lord, sometimes it seems like a deadline to me, honestly, it's always a blessing. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't keep my face there, if I did not abide, not just in the written word, but abide in the living word, as the written word is reminding me who you are and what you've said. And so, God, I'm gonna trust you this morning, and I'm gonna trust that the Holy Spirit will speak and will teach and will counsel each one of us as we go through these narratives um, and that we learn more and more about you and who you claim to be and why that is so important. Um, Lord, I'm so thankful that I know in my gut, I fully believe that you are the great I am, that you are God in the flesh and that you did what only you could do and that you came and you paid for my debt and you died as the perfect sacrifice on the cross. You conquered death and three days later you rose again. And you did that so that if I would look and live, I could be called a child of God, no longer a slave to sin, but your daughter, your bloodline. And when the son has set you free, you will be free indeed. I'm so thankful, God, that I don't have to strive for your love. You love me because I'm yours. And so we love you this morning. Teach us in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last week we finished up the story of um, the adulterous woman. I'm gonna rename her because I would be sick of being called that for thousands and thousands of years. I'm gonna say the redeemed woman. Um, and uh, then we also looked at where in John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Um, we talked about the fact that um, they knew that the Messiah would be a light to the nations. And look at what he has been teaching them all along during these feasts. He has told them that your forefathers ate manna in the desert, and yet they died. Quit striving for earthly food that will not satisfy. Quit going back to wells that will not satisfy. He says, true life is found in me. I am the bread from heaven. Um, he who believes in me shall have eternal life. I am the bread. So eat the bread and drink the blood. And he is trying to show them who he truly is. While they are remembering these wilderness wanderings, he's giving them great pictures of who he is. Life is found in him. John tells us that in chapter one. He says he is the light and the life of men. And so then we go and he says what? What's the next I am statement? I am the living water. I am the living water. Anyone who thirsts, let him come to me and drink, for the scripture says that out of his belly comes rivers of living water. And we talked about that. He is the source of all things. If you want to be useful and helpful, you stay close to the source. That's where the healing is. And if we stay in the source, then we will produce fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. He's using all of their symbolism, all of their history to show who he is. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. Here he says what? I am the light of the world. And do you remember where he is standing when he says it? You're like, no, I don't. Is it in verse 20? Why do I remember things like this? Is it in verse 20 where it says he's standing in the treasury? You remember that? The court of women in the treasury. What was special about that location? That is where, did I teach you this last week? That, that is where the, golden, the, the big golden lamp stands were um, during the Feast of the Tabernacle. Each one had four ginormous bowls filled with oil that would be lit, and it literally lit up all of the city 
Josephus says that it literally penetrated all the areas of the city. And where are they living? In booths. They're living in shelters, right? And so as they're living in these shelters with all the spaces in between, this amazing light is coming down and penetrating all of Jerusalem. And so it is in that location and the last and greatest day, that last night where the lights get turned off, that he says, actually, I am the light of the world. And so he's claiming something important because that light, As they looked at it, the temple was the highest place and that light would have shown it is representing the glory of God above the tabernacle. Remember, this is what they're remembering in this festival. And so here he is standing up saying, I am that. And what did John chapter one say? And he put on flesh and he tabernacled among us. He was a living temple And we could see the glory of the only begotten of the Son, full of grace and truth. So he is claiming to be that. And then he says, he who follows me will not walk in what? In darkness. So once again, we had that picture of what would happen when the tabernacle, right, was taken apart. It was designed to move because they were nomadic. And when it moved, the glory of the Lord would then lead them in the cloud by day and the fire by night. And it was by following him that they would make it to the promised land. And so here he is standing there as they are remembering this with these golden lampstands on the last night when they are out. And he says, I am the light of the world. Yes, I am the light to the nations. I am a living temple. The glory of God dwells on me. And he says, if you follow me, you will no longer walk in darkness. In other words, if you follow me, you will be led unto salvation. That is what he has been claiming um, in, in this scripture we talked about last week. So in verse 13, now what do you think is going to happen? We either have some kind of incident or uh, a miracle, and then we'll have, or he'll make some kind of statement, and then we have this discourse. So are you ready for the discourse? Because you know it's coming. He's just made a pretty big statement. So in verse 13, they say, So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I come from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. So what is he saying? No, (laughs) no. Just because I testify about myself doesn't mean it's not true. You may not think it'll stand up in a court of law, but the fact is it's true because I'm the only one who can testify about it because I'm the one who knows where I came from and where I am going. But the funny thing is, is you're the one who's making the judgments, but even if I judge, I'm still doing it according to your law because when I judge, it's not just me. It is the Father and I who judge together. And it's really interesting because he's like, wait a minute. You are the blind ones and you're judging because you're judging based on earthly things. You're trying to judge spiritual things based on earthly things. Matter of fact, you're trying to judge everything based on earthly things. I'm the light of the world. I'm the one who sees clearly, and I don't judge. Didn't we just see a picture of that? That's why I think it's not so bad that the second century scribes put this story in this place, because didn't we just see this in action? What did they do? They judged the woman based on their own ideas, right? But at the end of the day, the one who shined and could have judged her didn't, and the ones who really shouldn't have, and tried, dropped their stones, and walked away. And so you have this whole thing, and now you understand why he always referred to them as blind guides. You're blind guides, because they don't see. I wanna read to you John 12, 46 through 50. 
He says this, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I, d- for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. Okay, I'm gonna get to that second part in just a second. Do you understand what he is saying? I've come into the world so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I'm not here to judge them. But judgment is coming. What's gonna be the judge? The words that I'm speaking to you right now because they were the words that were given to me by my father. I never stepped out separate from my father. I always said what he said. Now remember, we talked about the word in chapter one. In the beginning was the word. So he talks about, right, he equates the God of creation with the word. And we talked about it when we first got started that he is saying that Jesus, the Logos, the word of God, is the one who spoke everything into existence by the will of the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is saying that he has come to give a commandment, and we're gonna see what it is, but he's come to speak a word. If they don't believe him, he's not here to judge them. But judgment is gonna come. But the one who judges them will actually be the commandment that he has left. In other words, what, what has he said? He's, it's kind of like this. You know when he spoke all things into existence? He set laws of creation in order. Like how about um, gravity? You don't have to believe gravity. But you jump off a building, doesn't matter if you believe gravity. Gravity is. It's a law, right? And so what he is saying is, I have the word, the same word that created these uh, creative laws I'm just setting out a whole nother law. It is a commandment. And that commandment says that he who believes in me, in Jesus, will have everlasting life and will never see death. He is saying, I'm not here to judge whether you believe that or not. But there is coming a day where that law will be just as significant as the law of gravity. Because in the end, that will be your judge what I have said. If you have not believed that I am who I say I am, then you will see death. So look at what he says in the last part of that verse. 49, for I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. So Jesus has come with a commandment. What to say and what to speak. Now what is the commandment? Look at verse 50. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. I love that. His commandment is eternal life. Do you see that it's singular? Hasn't he been saying this all along? Think about Nicodemus. What did he say to Nicodemus? Let me remind you. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet do you not believe in these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, and you do not receive our testimony. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? He keeps saying that. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Didn't he just tell these religious leaders? No, actually my testimony is true because I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. But then he says to Nicodemus, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So whoever believes in him has eternal life. How is this gonna work, Nicodemus? I've come with a new commandment. 
Because just as the bronze serpent is raised up in the wilderness and you have to look and live, it's going to happen that exact same way. You have to believe that I am who I say I am and the son of man will be lifted up. You have to look or believe in order to live. And as he goes on, what does he say to Nicodemus? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the commandment that Jesus came to teach. That is going to be the judge at the end of all things, is the word or the commandment that he gave. In the end, that will stand as the judge. Basically, it was the same in the feeding of the 5,000 right? They said to him at the end, okay, then what works? You remember he said, quit striving after food that does not satisfy. Their very next question was, what, was, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent him. That's it. What is the commandment that he came to share it is very simple. Believe. Believe that I am what? That I am all I'm telling you I am. I am that I am. And he's going to say that next in scripture. He says, I am the light of the world. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote. I love this quote. It says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Let me say that one more time. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. The fact is, unless you know the light of the world, you won't even understand this world. I believe Christianity because I've seen it plainly. Why? Because he made it plain. It was their pride and their refusal to see that kept them blind. But I've seen it. And not only have I seen it, but because of that, it's by that I see everything else. Do you remember the story I told you when I just had the, well, one of the days from you know where, and I decided I was just going to play golf anyway? Do you remember that? And do you remember when I went and played golf with that young man and the, some of the questions that he answered me? Sincere questions, and I'm so thrilled he had the guts to say it because everybody has those questions. And he says, well, I just don't understand. I don't understand why God lets bad things happen to good people. That's a good question. And here's the thing. You will never understand that unless you first Know him, because it is through him that the rest of the world makes sense. Do you understand that? It is through what Jesus has told us that when we look through those lenses, then the rest of the world makes sense. So because I know Christ, because I have the light of the world in me, then I look at this world through his lenses and I realize, well, I know why. Because this is not my home. I know why. Because he suffered in this place. This place is broken. It is broken. It is a mess. It does not operate like it was designed. And so it's a mess. And he says, so in this mess, you will struggle. There will be suffering. But take heart. I want you to know you have hope because I've overcome this world. You're not a citizen here. You're in it, and if you're in it, you have the job to do. What is your job? The same as mine. Pick up your cross and follow me. This is not your home. This, your destination is a promised land. So how do we get there? I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness. We will begin to see. We see things differently. We should see what's happening in our world in different ways because 
I believe in Christianity, but it is by that I see everything else. And I love what, um, oh, I don't remember. I think I might have gotten this out of the NIV commentary. I can't remember, but I thought it explained it well. Arlen Williams and five others knew their situation was hopeless. Floating in the icy Potomac River, the six survivors of the Air Florida Flight 90 knew there was no way to reach the shore just 40 yards away. They could hear the rescuers trying to reach them. At each attempt to cross the icy, but each attempt to cross the icy waters failed. Just as they were giving up hope, they heard the sound of an approaching helicopter. A life ring fell into the hands of one of the survivors, and he was pulled to safety. Next, it fell in Arlen's hands. He could be saved. But before the helicopter could pull him up, he handed the life ring to someone else. The chopper could only hold two, so it turned towards the shore and sped away. Just a few minutes later, it returned. Again, the life ring fell into Arlen's hands, and again, he handed it to someone else. The third time, he did the same. There would be no fourth opportunity. By the time the helicopter had returned, Arlen had disappeared below the surface. You remember that? I remember that on the news. In 2007, an article was written about Arlen Williams' sacrifice, and it appeared in Men's Health magazine. After recounting Williams' story, the author, the author of the article says, why would anyone put the lives of strangers ahead of his own? He couldn't even see the faces of the people he was saving because they were on the opposite side of the wreckage. Yet he made a sacrifice for them that their best friends might have refused. This puzzles the writer and he tries to analyze it scientifically and he says, extreme heroism springs from something that no scientific theory can fully explain. It's an illogical impulse that flies in the face of biology, psychology, actuarial statistics, and basic common sense. He even quotes Charles Darwin, who couldn't figure out how to crowbar heroism into his survival of the fittest theory. He said, he who was ready to sacrifice his life, as many a savage has been, rather than betray his comrades, would often leave no offspring to inherit his noble nature. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everything we see, we see through the light of the world. Things like this, heroism doesn't fit. It doesn't fit a life without God. It doesn't fit evolution. It doesn't fit the survival of the fittest because if you were heroic, there would be no survival. Of, do you understand what I'm saying? That's what Darwin is saying. If you're willing, that nature, if you're the person that has the nature to give up his life or sacrifice and you die, then that nature will not be able to be brought down to the next generation and the next generation. So the survival of the fittest says that heroism would have died out. Does that make sense to you? And so what I'm telling you is C.S. Lewis is correct. When we have the light, not only do we see Christ and we understand it, but everything else about our life and our world is seen through him. So no wonder people who do not have the light do not see things the way that we see it or understand things in the way that we understand it because we're not seeing through. They are walking in darkness and we are walking in the light. But keep in mind, what's the light look like for us? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We don't see a whole lot of light sometimes. We see the very next step lit up. And we have to trust and follow him because he knows the way unto salvation. Sometimes I wonder if we had a headlamp, man, I'd be in trouble, right? Because then I would think I just saw it all and I was like running when I should have been creeping along, trusting. And so that, that is the point where he says, I am the light of the world. I 
quicken you and I make you see the light if you're willing and then you will see through me from now on. John 15 says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. And in verse 12 of John 15, he says this, this is my commandment. Do you see that that's singular? So don't always be thinking law, okay? This is the word Jesus came. I came to bring a commandment. Now remember, he fulfilled the law. Those are the scales. What is he trying to get us to learn? Music. Because now it's going to be, if we believe this commandment, we are going to be people of a new covenant that he writes the law on our heart and it's going to come out. And he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Isn't it simple? He says this, yeah, the law, that's my nature. That was elementary, that was basic. But you're a people of a new covenant, not the people that I walked out and held by their hand walking out of Egypt and they broke the law anyway. No, this time it is a new covenant. I came and I fulfilled all that. And now the commandment I give you is believe that I am who I say I am. Believe in me and what I have done for you. <clears throat> and when you do that, you will be saved and you will be called a child of God. You will be different because I will take out your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will write it on your heart. How will I know this? Because by loving me, I'll be able to tell by the way you love others. What kind of love? A sacrificial love. Man, that's painful. Some people I want to love that way. Sheer strangers I want to love that way. But some other people in my life, I don't want to love that way at all. Right? Not at all. But that is what he is telling us. Then we go on. Let me make sure I know where I am. Okay. So he says, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. <clears throat> For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So I told you that. Then they say to him, therefore, okay, well, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. Like just the sheer question tells me you don't know him. Because if you knew him, then you would recognize him in who? I mean, what do we know about children and their parents? I would know a freed if they walked up to me in that, like, I don't know if you know my friend Kim, but I mean, I would just know her kids. Aren't you that same way? you just like, oh my gosh. And even if they aren't spitting images, the more you're around them, you could have been around Hillary and Zach, and you're going to see me or Doug all in them, good or bad, in our situation, right? And I gave Hillary a cup one day that said, um, I opened my mouth the other day and my mother fell out. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's just the way it is. And so he's saying, just the sheer question where you say, uh, because what, what do we know about the disciples? Well, John says in chapter one that when we beheld him, we saw the glory of the Father. It was so evident. 
in everything he did and said and was and his attitude. And so here they're like, where are your father? And he goes, well, the question that you just asked me tells me not only do you not know him, you for sure don't know him because you don't know me. And they still don't get it. And it says, um, then it goes on in verse 21. So he said to them again, because he has just said that to them prior before the adulterous woman, he says it in chapter seven, if you're curious, verse 33. So he's already said this once. He's gonna say it again. I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. He's like, at some point, I'm gonna go away. And the fact is, you can't, you won't find me and you can't come where I am. Why? It says it right there. Because you're gonna die in your sins. Why are they gonna die in their sins? Because they refuse to believe. They don't have to, but they are refusing to believe. So the Jews said, oh, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. They are so prideful and arrogant, they cannot imagine where he could possibly go without them other than Hades. That he's gonna kill himself. And, that, and you're just like, oh, my word, Thunderbird. He said to them, no. Okay, let me say again. And he's gonna give some contrasts here. He's gonna say, no. Okay, let me put this really clear. Don't think that he just minced words. Eventually he did because they were so stubborn. But he says, okay, you are from below. That doesn't mean hell. It means earth. You are from below I am from above. And then he goes, you are of this world. I am not of this world. I mean, he puts it plain. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Okay, that's a statement. Unless you believe that I am, and look, all before there's been, a predicate, I am the light of the world. You remember your English? I am the living water. I am the bread of life. But this time it's really no predicate. Basically what that is saying is that you believe that I am. I am that I am. I am Yahweh. He's putting it plain. Hasn't he already built the case? He's used all of their history to try to explain who he is. You know the God of Abraham? He's going to say in just a minute, I am. You remember Moses? You remember the one he spoke to on the mountain? Right? Do you remember the supernatural food? I am the bread of life. You remember the water from the rock? I am the living water. Do you remember the glory of God and the cloud by day and the fire by night? I am the light of the world. And he is showing them that. I am life. I am the source. I am the way to salvation. You will not be able to follow me because I'm going somewhere that you can't come because you're going to die in your sins. Why? Because I've told you that if you do not believe that I am Yahweh, that I am God, you will die in your sins. And they go on. So they said to him, who are you? Does that wear you out? I'm gonna ask you, how well could you explain you? I mean, I think he's done a pretty good job. Okay, who are you? <laughs> Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me, oh, you know it'd be a good exercise for you, by the way, preparing for the blind man story? Uh, underline every time Jesus refers to himself as being sent. Okay, just a little FYI, okay. He says, um, he, sent, he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. He's like, listen, how do you still not know who I am? I have said everything I've come to say, 
and you still don't know. I know a lot about you. I could say a lot about you, but I won't because that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to say what the Father wants me to say. And they did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, does that seem familiar to you? How, Nicodemus says, like the bronze serpent will be lifted up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Okay, not only are we talking about a sacrifice, but they don't even realize that what they're about to do will literally put him on the throne. It will glorify him. It will raise him up that he is the Messiah. And he goes on to say, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am and that I do nothing on my own authority. Then you'll know because by then, it will be complete. By then, I would have done everything the Father asked me to do, even unto death. Who's gonna know it? Everyone will know it. Now, some will know it when they realize at the moment and the Holy Spirit quickens them and they will know it and they will believe. They will bow the knee voluntarily in belief, but I'm going to tell you, this event, when he is lifted up, at some point, everybody will know it, and eventually, everyone will bow the knee. Some will do it mandatorily. Do you understand? He's like, when the Son of Man is lifted up, that is when you will know, because at that point, it will be sealed. It will be complete, because I have done everything he asked me to do, and nothing, everything, hold on, I wanna say that right, that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. I love that. Because in that moment, what do we feel, or what did Jesus feel? And let me read, look at 1632, because it says it also. John 1632. He says this, behold, the hour is coming. What hour? When the Son of Man will be lifted up, okay? Behold, the hour is coming indeed, and it has come. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. So what's gonna happen to all the disciples? They'll be scattered, and you'll leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, you have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I love so much part of this because he says, he tells them in advance, okay, that once I I am gonna do everything he asked me to do and the Father will never leave me alone. You will, but the Father will never leave me alone. And I'm telling you this in advance so that you can have some peace. Because when you do what I'm saying you're gonna do, do you know how hard that was for them? That they betrayed him, they left him alone, that they don't know what's happening, that their whole world got turned upside down. I'm telling you in advance that I'm gonna do everything the Father asked me to do and he won't leave me alone. And when you finally realize this, I'm telling you in advance so that you can have peace. Because you need to understand that yes, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, it didn't end there. I have overcome the world. And we go on to learn that just like the father never left the son alone because he did everything that pleases him, that Jesus will never leave us alone because as Jesus is in the father, we are in Christ. And some of you may be thinking, but wait a minute, what about the time of the cross where he says, my father, my father, what? Why have you forsaken me? Okay, well I'm gonna tell you right now, you cannot separate the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he says in this, I will not be alone, why? Because I always do what pleases the Father. I am going to 
absolutely do everything that he tells me to do to the point of death. So there was not, but in order for him to be our great high priest and to understand all of our suffering, what must he experience? He must experience the emotion of what sin does when it comes. And in the darkness of the moment of when sin was poured out on Christ, I believe he felt in that darkness what it is like to be separated. But what is the truth? He wasn't. The father was always with him. The cool thing is, because Jesus did all that the father asked to do, right, in his physical body, he submitted the flesh to the father. Therefore, there was no distance in their relationship because of sin. Because he did that, he has now allowed us to be children of God, which means that he took all of our sin away. There is no separation between us and the Father. Why? Because we receive that righteousness of the Son. Let me tell you what sin does. Sin no longer separates me from Christ. I'm there. I'm his child. He dwells inside of me. I am secure, and we're gonna look at this more next week when it talks about slave and son. I am secure. The reason sin feels like a separation is because of what happens in me because of it. Have you ever uh, seen your kids when they've done something bad, right? And they're like, or when you know in your gut that you've done something. I, I wish I wasn't, but I'm like a repenter. For some reason, I feel like I just need to, you know, fillet myself in public when I do something wrong. I don't know if anybody else is like that. I'm not a good hider. It doesn't work for me. But also, repenting doesn't always work for me either, to be honest. But do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I know if there's something in there that's keeping me because I back up because I know it's there. That's the struggle. Because there is nothing between us because Jesus died and, and he took it away. But there is a feeling of separation because of what I know and experience. Um, the beauty is he understands what it is to feel that way. And I don't know about you, but I, I, in my message over the weekend, I'm constantly saying, life is the sky, emotions are the weather. We need to understand our emotion, but it's emotion. Sometimes how we feel is just how we feel, but it's not what? True. So there are very, very often I feel alone, don't you ever feel alone? Or I feel like I don't deserve to be loved by God, or I feel like he's not with me, that he's abandoned me. I feel like he's done stuff to me. But what? That's not true. The truth is, Jesus says, I'm telling you in advance, no matter what it looks like, he never left me alone. That is the fact the father never left him alone, not for one second, and I promise you, he has never left you alone either, if you know him. Because by believing in him, you have become the daughter of God. And there is that connection, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I was like, what is that? I was back in 15. Okay, here we go. We're gonna end this section. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, oh, because in verse 30 it says what? As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Okay, and then the next thing it says, and Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, what word? Do we read this like evangelicals today? 
that, oh my gosh, if I hold on to this word and I preach this word and I have this word memorized and I do everything, I go back and I get back in the law and I do, oh, if you remain and if you keep all the commandments, that's not what it says. If you abide in my word, what was his commandment? The commandment is to eternal life, to believe in me and have eternal life. The gospel message, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's all it, rolled up into one. If you abide, if you remain, if you stick to it, if it's the real deal, if no matter what happens in your life, you just can't walk away from the fact that you know that you know that you know that to believe is eternal life. You may not know a whole lot more than that, but you believe that he is who he said he is and that he is the light of the world. And what did he just say? If you abide in me, If you abide in my word, you truly are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth and light are synonymous there. If you abide in me, if you remain, if you hold on to that truth of the gospel, then you have the light of the world. That truth will set you free. Why? Because the light of the world will lead you unto salvation. That is why. So in my testimony, when I say, and there I was, even when I questioned everything, and still do sometimes, there I was, with an agony I could not escape, but a faith I could not deny. Because at the end of the day, if they were to ask me, Jesus would say to me, Shannon, are you gonna leave me too? I can't. I want to, I'm really upset, (laughs) I want to. And I don't understand a lot of things I thought I understood, Lord, in all of this. But I can't, I will remain because I'm convinced there is no other way. And once the sun has set you free, Once you've received the light, you can't unsee. And so no matter what it is that happens, you remain, you abide. Yes, I can maybe not be useful because I can walk away from the source, but he is my source. What will be evidence of it? He says, you will know my true disciples because they will abide. They will always come back to that source at the end of the day because that is what I have put my trust in. That is what I trust in for eternal life. And like C.S. Lewis says, I believe in Christianity like I believe I can see the sun, but it is also through that by which I see everything else. I cannot imagine being in this world today and not having the light of the world and looking through struggles and pain and knowing I've told you these things so that in me you will have peace because this world is junk. But I've overcome it. I can't imagine living in this world right now if I did not have the anchor of that in my soul. He is the light of the world. He who follows me will no longer walk in darkness. What have I said to you? What have I said to you? What have I said to you? I have said, he who believes in me has eternal life. I have come from the Father who has sent me to tell you this commandment. And if you will keep this commandment, You will have eternal life. And what is that gonna look like? By loving me, I'm I'm your father, you're gonna look like me. Well, what was I like? There's greater love, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. I'm sorry to tell you people, but the kingdom of heaven is upside down. Everything we want to do in the flesh, his kingdom pretty much looks the other way. 
And that is what he's trying to tell them and he will continue to tell them that when we get into the dialogue or of slave versus child. And then the most beautiful thing is, then he gives us a story to make us understand what it is to see or be blind. <clears throat> All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. God, if there is anyone here that has never truly understood the simplicity and the oh, just amazing truth of the gospel, I hope today they understood it fully. That Lord, you can't legislate morality. You can't legislate the flesh. There aren't enough laws in the world. And then eventually, we begin to sit down and worship the laws. But God, instead, you tried to show them through the beautiful law what your nature was, but they couldn't do it. And so God, because of your great love, you came down and you literally fulfilled it all because that's who you are. And you have said, I have done what you cannot do. And so do this. Believe in me. Believe that I am who I said I am. Believe that I have been here all along. Before the beginning began, there was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and all things are made by him. Believe that my redemption is true. And if you look at me, and you, you will live, you will have eternal life. And then, that is the beginning. Because at that point, I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And it will no longer be about being a slave to sin or a slave to the scales. But instead, the scales will be written on your heart and you will begin to learn how to make music. And when you do that, you will then be the light of the world. People will see you and they will want what you have. God, may we stay close to the source so that we can see as you see. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and give us a heart for this world and to remember that this is not our home. We are passing through and it is our job to live in a way and to love in a way that people will wanna join. So we love you and we worship you today and we thank you for the good news of the gospel message. In Jesus' name, amen.